Um, we had never met, uh, even though it was my son, we'd never met physically in the same room until the royalties from this book paid for my trip to Australia. So if you go online, there's a video called Co-Author Father and Son Meet on YouTube, and we kind of document the whole story, uh, including the fact that it was a surprise when I actually finally went, and uh, it's, it's, it turned out really, really cool. So I get to meet my granddaughter and him and all that. Anyways, uh, we split duties on this. Uh, he's a fantasy guy. I'm a sci-fi guy. So when we wrote our combined novel, we made fantasy creatures into alien species instead of the usual paranormal stuff. And uh, so it just kind of went with, went with that. Uh, in this particular reading, I'm going to uh, do the origin story of the uh, human vampire and uh, how he came about. The Battle of, oops, you know what, I probably, if I do that in front of my camera, I can't see me. <laughs> you see the cover the whole time, there you go. The Battle of al Hikab took place in July 16, 1212. The Spanish knights, led by Alfonso VIII of Castile and supported by various Christian cohorts, traveled the Despanjaperos Pass, being led by a local shepherd that knew the area. They arrived in the early morning, surrounded the Moorish al Mahad army, and a short and fierce battle ensued. The Christian losses were put at under 2,000, while the Moors lost 50 times that number. That's a fact. It's an actual battle. I didn't make that up. Mirko Radivaj was a knight squire, conscripted from his Balkan lord to serve as commander under the papal edict of crusade. He had been as far east as Constantinople and had, made, had come to the west to aid his fellow Christians as they pushed the Moors out of the Iberian Peninsula. Being the youngest of four sons, He'd have little inheritance, and he knew his prosperity lay in what work he could find with his sword arm. His latest venture would be in retaking the land that would be dispersed to new baronies, or at least need vassals to hold it until the royal line could be straightened out. By early evening on the day of the total rout of the Almohad army, there were still thousands of Moors laying about the battlefield, some needing aid. His fellow Christians were more inclined to dispatch them than heal them. As a matter of fact, that had been the point of the contention between the Iberian noblemen and their eastern allies. The French, Balkan, and Italian knights ha were hard men, having fought in the east with the very wall at the very walls of Jerusalem. They wanted to kill the Moorish fighters, as well as the Jewish and the Moorish settlers in the area. The Iberians had a more liberal stance, since they'd coexisted with both peoples until the latest push to reestablish the Christian dominance. Mirko's knight marshal had approached him just after the evening mess and instructed him to take ten men and provide merciful release to the remaining Moors still on the battlefield. Any valuables and spoils they found would be considered a tithe to be split three ways, the church, the knight marshal, and Mirko's men. Mirko gathered his troop and left camp as the sun was setting. He journeyed to the well-trodden battleground near the, the abandoned camp of the Moors. Their task was made easier by the moaning and rustling sounds of the wounded and dying. He, they set about their work. Two hours later, Mirko was sitting on a rock surveying his hall under the dim glow of a field lantern. Rings, jewels, and various metal ingots filled his bag. The focus light of the lantern glimmered on the blade of a dagger with an emerald in the hilt and ornate scroll work in the bright metal handle. It was a very thin blade, about two hands width in length. The scabbard was bright and shiny with leather on the end to protect the fine metal work. Instead of a belt loop, there was a spring steel clip that extended beyond the top of the hilt, allowing the dagger to ride low off a belt. Mokro placed a dagger in the top of his boot, clasping the clip above the top fold and tested its ability to stay in place by stomping his foot a few times. He felt the metal against his leg while the top of the hilt was hidden below the edge of his boot. That little treasure wouldn't be included in the tie of the county he'd submit to the night marshal. A noise in the dark alerted Mirko, and he shuttered his lamp, closing his bag of trinkets and placing his hand on his sword. He strained to see out in the gray and the black of the Iberian countryside. He heard a man scream, Allah, yim him ya nai, sharba alim. Then a muffled cry with a gurgling moan, followed by silence. Mirko knew what the man had yelled, God protect me, a blood drinker. That seemed strange. He had been called a number of things during the evening's work, most often cursed infidel. He drew a sword and walked cautiously toward the sound to see which of his men had warranted such a name. Mirko navigated the rocky ground up a small rise into a group of broken wall ruins made up of grain storage bins and crumbling milling worms. He stepped over the lowest portion of the wall and he felt his foot give way on a soft surface tumbling into the dark recess of the unused bin. He lay on his back, breathing the dusk he'd kicked up, and felt like a fool for not using his lamp, which now lay on its side just out of reach. Mirko thought about sitting up, which was never easy, though he wasn't fully armored. Like all men in the field, he still wore light male leggings and a male shirt covered by his heavy linen surcoat that bore his patron's colors. The sword must have fallen over the, by the wall where he'd dropped it, 
as he pitched forward. All in all, he was glad nobody had been around to see him his less than gallant entry. He glanced over toward the wall. He could see the outline of a pile of cloth that he tripped over and the sword lying on it. He rolled toward it in an effort to come up on his knees. As he attempted to sit up, he was planted back to the ground, pinned by a pressure on upon his chest that took his breath away. He reached and found a hand with an iron grip holding him down. He grabbed at the wrist and attempted to gain leverage with it and to twist away. It didn't move, and the downward pressure to his chest increased dramatically. He looked to his sword, watching it fall to the wall side behind the now moving pile of cloth. The struggles were becoming less pronounced as he focused on trying to draw a breath, resisting the relentless and unmoving pressure of the hand that penned him. The nearest end of the cloth pile in his line of sight resolved itself into a round head-like shape. There was some scrabbling under the cloth, and the seconds seemed like hours until the head pulled back and Mirko's view was improved. What he saw buried in the cloth drove a cold chill into his spine. Two blank eyes stared back at him. Behind the eyes, a dark man, a moor, lay perfectly still. His throat was torn out. The rounded cloth shape that had separated from the dead moor now turned towards Mirko. Two bright red eyes stared at him from above the mouth filled with predatory teeth. Congealed and splattered blood surrounded the deadly maw. The cloth fell away, and Mirko saw the creature wore a Moorish garb of a Sal Saladinian warrior. A scimitar was at the creature's side, and badges of rank were sewn into the fabric. What manner of Galvat spawn are you, Mirko, speak, or squeaked out with his now limited breath. The red-eyed Mord looked at him calmly, his skin slightly lighter than a pure Afrique. His pointier ears and slimmer facial features gave him an almost Gaelic symmetry. He was tall. When he tossed aside the cloths, raising slightly and sliding closer to Mirko, his long legs unfolded underneath him gracefully, almost snake-like. Mirko had seen him earlier, during the battle, a tall moor that cut his way through the unit covering Mirko's pikeman's right side. The moor was three heads taller than anyone and swung his blade with enough force to chop through appendages, even splitting men in half. The Almohad commanders hadn't blown retreat to protect the caliph. If, oh, sorry. If the Almohad commanders hadn't blown retreat to protect the caliph Muhammad al Nasar's withdrawal, the tall man would have continued his decimation. Mirko remembered he'd seen the moor bristling with a, like a porcupine with dozens of arrows protruding that had no effect on him. Mirko assumed that he must have had armor under his robe, but saw none in evidence at the moment. I'm no devil, Sahib. I'm nothing like you've ever seen before or ever will again, the Moor said with a heavy accent. Tell me your name, demon, so I may inform St. Peter and the Lord Almighty that the gates of hell are open and you walk this earth. The Moor demon laughed, slid closer, and tightened his grip on the Mirko's surcoat. I'm no demon, young one. Wasai Peter and Allah will know nothing of me. And when you see Allah, give him a message for me. I will, Mirko said defiantly. Tell him that you met your end in the teeth of an invidian. One who has watched Allah's words get twisted, his faith get usurped, and his laws get abused to fulfill the ends of evil and power-hungry men. Tell him I hope to one day see his creations grow beyond these petty wars and take their place among the stars. Can you remember that, young one? I can, demon, Mirko said, spitting the words back, trying to fight back the blackness that was clouding the edge of his vision as his inability to fill his lungs took its toll. Good, and now I must feed. Seems my cohort was less bountiful than I desired, and your archers were much more accurate than I was led to believe. The demon moor reached for Mirko's head, grabbing a handful of hair. He twisted Mirko's head to one side, applying pressure to expose his neck and arch it upward. As the demon moor bent lower, and twisted, it twisted Mirko's body slightly and the head with a hand on his chest. Mirko's world was filled with a new pain when the demon moor lunged in and sank its fangs into his neck. He felt the penetration, then a sawing motion, followed by the moisture and warmth on the neck. The pain went away quickly and he gave in to a floating sensation. He actually heard about pilgrims floating above paddling waters in the Sea of, Light, of Lot. His mind drifted into a peaceful acceptance, the warm embrace filled with euphoria. Then he heard the voices, the screaming, the sounds of battle. He opened his eyes, feeling the searing pain of the demon war biting in and penetrating or manipulating his neck with his mouth. He struggled, but his arms were weak. His arms and legs felt numb and tingly. Shadows ran around, people yelling, two, maybe three more. He knew he should understand him, but they didn't make sense. The dagger, his tithe. He reached for it and felt in inside his boot. Mirko willed himself to hold the dagger handle, to draw it, to turn it toward the demon moor. His hand felt like tingling lightning bolts where it were striking it. He thrust it upward into his attacker, once, twice, three times, just below the breastbone. He shoved it repeatedly with what little energy he had left, and he lost consciousness. Fog, thunk, a groan, thunk, crack, chopping. Mirko heard the sounds of chopping wood, or chopping wood, no, meteor sounding than wood. 
He needed to open his eyes. He heard voices. He knew them and the chopping sound. He opened his eyes and looked to his left. His neck ached. He remembered being hurt or stabbed. No, bitten. Yes, bitten on the neck. Mirko reached for the room and felt it wound and felt his neck, expecting to touch flayed flesh and broken skin. But there was none. The textures were mixed. There was moisture and rough patches along the some, with something dried on his skin. His blood? It couldn't be, because he was alive. It must have been a dream. He sat up. He guessed it was early morning. The sky was gray, but there was no rain or no sun. Rain? No, there was no rain. There were no clouds. Bright, twinkling stars filled his vision, more brilliant than he remembered them being. Two men, his backs to him, stood a few paces away. Based on their livery, they were his men. One of them was hacking away at something with his sword. He wondered what the man was hitting. A dead body? That did not seem right to Mirko. They, need to, they knew to dispatch the wounded enemies when found and be done with it. This was more of a, there was no need to mutilate the body. Mirko tried to speak, but his throat felt closed off. He stood up and walked to his men. He felt strange. He moved quickly, his hair mussed from the breeze he generated, taking the six steps toward them. Those six steps covered in the time that his men's swarm arm had traveled barely one-fourth of its arc. He stood behind his men, about to say something, but instead he focused on the glow emanating from them. Not all of them, just their exposed skin, their head, their neck, a warm, comforting glow, an appetizing glow. He grew hungry, very hungry. He thought of the lamb roasting on a spit back in the camp, but that didn't seem appealing. His mind reeled, culinary possibilities. None would satisfy his current craving. He wanted something else, something special, something near. The glow, now that was tempting, satisfying, easy, close. It was his. One of the men turned and Mirko saw it was Edwin, Edwin who he'd known for three years. Edwin whom he'd marched with numerous in battles. Edwin who had shared meals, mead and women. Edwin who had come to this place looking for his friend Mirko. Mirko grabbed Edwin by the shoulder, gripping him hard. He felt Edwin's hot collarbone snap as Mirko pulled him close just within, with one hand. Without a thought, Mirko struck the other man in the mid-back. Three hands linked below the shoulder blades. The man dropped as his legs gave way and his breath left him. Mirko strugg or Edwin struggled and failed, his eyes wide with terror as he tried to escape from Mirko's death vice-like grip. Mirko pulled him in and struck him, biting into er Edwin's neck as he twisted his head to the side. Edwin struggled for a moment more, then went slack. Mirko felt the warm liquid flowing into his mouth as he created a suction and drew Edwin's blood into him. He didn't feel the need to swallow as his mouth filled. The blood wasn't reaching the back of his throat. It held a slightly coppery and overwhelmingly honey-like flavor. He felt a satisfying warmth in the chest and then a burst of energy. His wounds stopped hurting. His aches disappeared. He felt alive. After long moments, the taste of Edwin's blood soured and Mirko spit the last of it out. He released Edwin and looked at the lifeless corpse. Ed Edwin was pale and cool. The glow that had excited Ed uh, uh, Mirko earlier was gone. Edwin was a husk, drained of any useful nourishment. Mirko turned to the other man, the one whose back he'd broken. He'd known to wound that one without killing him. How? Instinct? A meal to be had at his leisure. M Mirko fed again. Bang. <laughs> Thank you. Uh.